Welcome to Hudson Institute. My name is Peter Raud. I'm a senior fellow here and direct our Center on Europe and Eurasia at the Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome today for a book talk, Gerlinde Greutel, who's an associate professor of international politics and transatlantic relations at the famed University of Regensburg in Germany. Regensburg, the university, most in the news a little over, well, now almost two decades ago when Pope Benedict gave a famous lecture at the University of Regensburg. He also was on the faculty there. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to have you here today. Congratulations are in order because you've just published a new book. We have it here, Russia, China, and the Revisionist Assault on the Western Liberal International Order. Gelinde, welcome to Hudson Institute. Thank you so much for having me. I hope they'll clap at the end of the conversation as well. So but do I, a, so do I. <laughs> it'll be a friendly talk. Uh, you have here in the title, Russia and China. And the third topic du jour really is on the globe here because the globe is spun to the United States, which I would say are probably the three primary points of focus in the text. But because you are a German academic, uh, I have to begin with a question about Germany. And Germany does feature in page one of your opening chapter where you quote Olaf Scholz, the current social democratic chancellor, who's running the coalition government in Berlin, and his now famous, it's almost cliched to reference to it, a speech uh, announcing a watershed moment, the famed Zeitenwende in German security and foreign policy in the immediate aftermath of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So perhaps we could just start there a little bit for our viewers and listeners about uh, German foreign and security policy. And I would just put, I suppose, the question to you quite broadly, what is Zeitenwende? And uh, how is Germany performing in its Zeitenwende to date? So thank you very much for that first question. Um, German Zeitenwende, the change in eras, was a, for a term that was coined really on February 27th, 2022, a couple of days after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And it marks an acknowledgement that the world has changed, that the world of that era is different than the world before February 24th, uh, when Russia waged that invasion. And it embodies in one term, actually, the, the many illusions that Germany had about foreign and security policy. Because the German public and also political leaders, they were genuinely surprised that a land war in Europe was possible, that Russia would wage that invasion. Because before February 24th, there was a great deal of um, hesitancy to call out Russia for what it is, namely a destructive revisionist states in Eastern Europe seeking to recreate its imperial uh, control over Eastern Europe. And German foreign and security policy has been guided by themes like uh, change through interweavement, change through trade. That if we all trade with each other, the world would become a more peaceful, a more benign, a better place. And uh, this has turned out to be a faulty proposition because change does not come through trade. So countries do not democratize uh, once you reach out economically to them, but it has been very firmly embedded in the German political mindset. And uh, the war in Ukraine really shattered that. And so the Zeiten and the change in era speech that Chancellor Scholz gave uh, really brought that home to everybody, uh, that the world is a dangerous place. We live in a geopolitical world, but the degree of surprise that you found in Germany it was really needs to be attributed to the degree of illusionary hopes that guided German foreign and security policy beforehand. So would you say that Germany's new foreign security policy, if we can call it that, and that really is, I suppose, my question, is a difference in degree or is it a difference in type altogether? Is it really a new era or do you see continuation with what preceded it? You see both. You see, you see continuity and change. So on the change side, a lot has happened since February 2022. Um, and I give policymakers credit for that. Uh, so Germany supports Ukraine uh, in a very determined way. Now it does. Uh, it started off rather slowly after the invasion. There was a lot of he hesitancy before. But Germany has come around to supporting Ukraine uh, economically, financially, through humanitarian means, but also militarily. And that's the key point, because in order for Ukraine to survive, Ukraine needs uh, support on the military side, weaponry, etc., so that it can fight for its own defense. So a lot of change has been going on there, but then there is also a lot of continuity, because uh, these firm beliefs, uh, 
uh, that the world can be pacified if we just uh, engage in multilateral debates, if we just engage in multilateral diplomacy, if we reach out to one another, then things will turn out fine. So this belief has been shattered by the invasion of Ukraine, but I don't think it has vanished or gone away because this is just very deeply ingrained in Germany's foreign and security policy identity. So we see continuity and change, and whether it turns out to be a real shift, a real change in eras, it remains to be seen. I think it's too early to call whether we are really there. So one metric that I think Washington follows when it tracks German foreign policy is its concrete uh, support for Ukraine, so military assistance, economic support, humanitarian aid, both in receiving refugees and also um, in, in, in humanitarian financial support beyond the budgetary support for regular economic functions. Um, a second metric, though, is also how Germany is revamping its own armed forces. And in the hopes, I think, of a lot in Washington, and you can um, tell us whether or not this is illusory, uh, have Berlin take over more of a security responsibility role for Europe writ large. Bridge Colby, um, an analyst here in, in Washington, had a piece in the Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, uh, speaking of Bavaria, a Munich-based mm-hmm. paper, just the other day in which he uh, warned Europe that if the U.S. has to pivot more in the event of war to the Indo-Pacific, there would be almost a vast sucking sound, to, uh, uh, to, to use a phrase that Ross Perot, who will mean nothing to, our, uh, to, to some in our audience today, but others will remember, ran for president in the early 90s in a different context, used that phrase about trade. But you would have a lot of American military assets flowing in that direction, and it would leave Europe potentially exposed. Germany is the largest economy, so the thinking would go, might be able to take over some of that burden. How should we think about that? Um, And uh, is in that second metric, not just support for Ukraine, but Germany itself, is there progress being made? Or do you you think that's still rather halting? I wish there were was more progress (laughs) that was being made. Um, We are still lacking far behind what is really necessary. And Elbert Colby's piece, uh, I read it, uh, it was well taken because he made clear that uh, Europeans should be very worried if that scenario comes to pass we don't have a good plan B right now. Uh, If the Americans direct their attention elsewhere, and they probably will, the United States does focus on China, does focus on Asia, Europeans have to pick up um, more of the burden on the European side of the equation for very good reasons. And we are really far from anywhere where we want to be in that regard. So when it comes to reforming the German military, uh, another element of that change in eras, the Titan when the speech was uh, extra budget, of a 100 billion euro for the German military, which was absolutely necessary because the German armed forces have been underfunded for quite some time and we really need to build up military capability and strength. But then again, we're still lacking behind when it comes to the 2% goal of NATO, uh, spending 2% of GDP on defense, which is what all allies had agreed on. The recent national security strategy of Germany, the first ever to be published, Uh, reiterated that promise in sort of a toned-down way. So it spoke of 2% of GDP on a multi-year average that would be spent on defense. You know, why do you do that? (laughs) If we are really in a different era, and I think we are, we need to get serious about these things. So the idea that Germany will take up more of a responsibility for European security, yes, we see some of that. But then the deficits, they outweigh the progress that's been made so far. Uh, And among the deficits of European security becoming more self-reliant are certainly the differences in attitudes that we see within Europe. And let me just take uh, France and Poland as two of Germany's immediate neighbors. So the French view has always been that strategic autonomy, sort of autonomy from the United States, a European capability independent of the United States, that this was a, 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 a good goal, that this, this was something that should be aspired. Now you ask the Polish about that, and they're like, oh, no, no way, because they only trust in the, in the US security guarantees for their own very existence and survival, because they really fear uh, the Russian security threat. And you have Germany in the middle sort of trying to mediate between these positions, and in the end, Uh, We have um, integration in security and defense policies and baby baby steps. And this is really not enough to provide for European security in a more self-reliant sense. So as of now, 
Europe depends on the United States for about everything, materially, but also strategically, intellectually. And we saw that also with regards to support for Ukraine, where European states were very hesitant to come up with ideas of their own. They were far more comfortable following Washington's lead. So everybody tends to look to Washington. You know, what does the Biden administration do in supporting Ukraine? And then European states align themselves with that, with that course of action. But going forward, uh, more needs to be done on the European side to be capable materially, but also intellectually, to take the lead on our own. Perhaps just to put a slightly nuanced or different spin on the balance between Warsaw and Paris role that Berlin as the major kind of central European power um, takes on. I've always interpreted Germany's um, sort of, I wouldn't call it balancing, but uh, mediation there as being more between Paris and Washington in a way and uh, less taking on board the concerns or less, I mean, Frank Reiter Steinmeier, the president of Germany has now famously said we should have listened more to the Central and Eastern Europeans. And because Washington and Warsaw on transatlantic security issues have tended to be relatively close, there's, it's almost indistinguishable, but really it hasn't been so much the polls that have had a hearing as much as, as perhaps Washington. Um, but I guess my question stemming from that is, do you think, um, that the German and Central and Eastern European strategic outlook has merged more in, in the past year um, is, as, as, as the war exacerbated or lessened sort of the geopolitical differences within Europe? Hmm. That's an excellent question. Maybe on the first one, yes, you're right. Germany has been sort of mediating between Washington and Paris. But then, especially in the EU context, the German position has always been that integration has to bring all on board, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the French would be okay with a different, um, different paces in European integration moving forward with a more selective group of those willing to do more and then the others stay out of it. And here Berlin has been very careful to bring in the Central and Eastern European voices as well. So maybe it's not a difference in our assessments, yeah. but just a nuance whether we look at the NATO angle or the EU angle. Uh, the second question, whether views have aligned, um, I guess the answer is also a yes and no. So there are, you have to look hard on the left and right edges of the political spectrum in Germany to find those who argue that Germany should get closer to Russia and who just deny that there is a problem at all, which is interesting nonetheless that you have right-wing voices and voices on the left who would join the same chorus uh, and say, for example, that the sanctions, uh, they are hurting ourselves. Uh, we should get out of it and should establish a relation relationship with Russia once again. But they are fringe voices, I would say. When you look to the political elites at large, a firm consensus right now exists that we have to stand up to Russia, uh, that this invasion has really changed uh, the way we think about European security. So in that sense, yes, there has been a narrowing of attitudes. But maybe the key question is about the long term. So where do you envision European security go a couple of years down the road? And here, maybe German political elites would be more inclined to say, OK, we have to figure out a, a modus vivendi with Russia of some sort down the road in the future, whereas the Poles, the Balts, uh, they would be more on the hawkish side and see no room for compromise whatsoever. So the, uh, as just a finishing question in this sort of round on German foreign and security policy, the, the uh, at the very minimum, saber rattling in Belarus with Wagner moving towards the Sawaki gap, the moving of tactical uh, nuclear weapons into uh, already an arm to the teeth um, immediately on the borders of NATO, Belarus, uh, security apparatus. That activates in Poland, I think, a lot of worries and fears and a lot of um, immediate kind of deterrence and counterforce moves, new deployments, et cetera. What, what, what impressions has it left in Germany? Is it to move right in behind the Poles? Is it to try to, uh, uh, to, try to find an off-ramp with the Russians? I mean, I, I think this perhaps, what I'm hinting at, is a good case study for how real tight and is in, in the German mindset. Mm. Let me maybe focus on German society a little bit more than mm. on the political system, because I think it's important to understand where these countries are coming from. Uh, 
So when you look at public opinion polls before February 2022, Russia, or also China for that matter, has not featured in any way or form as a security challenge on the Germans' minds. So when you ask German society what they're worried about, it's the pension system, it's healthcare, it's climate change, it's all sorts of things, but it's traditionally it has not been Russia. Now, you look at Poland, of course the result is totally different because the Polish people have cared about the Russian security threat for quite a while. And there was a disconnect between the two. Now, with the most recent saber rattling, which just comes on top of everything else that's been going on, so it doesn't need the saber rattling regarding Belarus to yeah. really make the case that there is a danger in Eastern Europe, um, I would still say that the German public at large has, um, has seen this shock of land war in Europe, which changed many folks' minds. But the degree of threat perception is still not identical to that, what you would have in Poland, for example. So it's not folks wondering or fearing immediate conflict uh, at, close to their homes every day, but it's rather um, abstract fears about this whole conflict possibly going nuclear. This is what is on people's minds in Germany. So yes, the countries have become closer, but when you ask just average people on the street, when you look at public opinion polls, you would still see the disconnect that the threat perception is different and stronger the closer you get to the conflict in Ukraine. Let's turn a little bit to your book. Um, and I have to say, for those of you uh, watching at home, one of the real beauties of this book is it is chock full of exhaustive citations. So basically, anybody who's written anything over the, over the preceding several years is cited in here, which makes it kind of a nice, I think, resource if you're looking for considered opinion on on anything related to great power politics and generally the intellectual currents of our current age. But um, maybe I'll just start with that simple question. Why did you write this book? Um, what, what moved you to, to, to undertake this exhaustive study? So writing a book about great power politics between Russia, China, and the West may seem very obvious right now. The work began many, many years ago. And at that time, I was just astounded by the fact that folks would really believe that Russia and China in the post-Cold War era would be interested in joining a US-led liberal international system. Because it occurred to me as sort of alien to think that those two great powers who think of themselves as rule makers rather than rule takers, that they would just integrate smoothly into an existing international order that has largely been shaped and designed and upheld by the United States and its Western partners. So that was the, one of the puzzling things that I encountered that in the post-Cold War era in the 1990s, early 2000s, you had all these debates about the end of history and how we would all get along and turn to democracy and market economy. And it seemed rather alien to me to just believe that this was possible. And then the second part of that was that you could see really beginning in the late 2000s that both Russia and China turned revisionists. So they started to stand up against the status quo order and they tried to alter the rules of the game uh, in more nuanced ways, maybe in some areas more openly and directly in others. But to anyone who was interested in seeing it, one could really see beginning in 2007, 2008, 2009, that both Russia and China were um, working against this, what we call rules-based liberal international order. And that's why I wrote this book, to explain why they both turned revisionist, uh, sometimes aligning forces, working together, but it's really a story of those two powers separately going revisionist against the established status quo order. And hiding in plain sight in a way, everyone now cites the 2007 Munich Security Conference exactly. speech by Vladimir Putin, but that wasn't exactly in hushed, whispered tones to his fellow intelligence officers. He was announcing it to the world, and Hu Jintao, I think, was the first Chinese uh, Communist Party leader to adopt the, the nine Dash line in the, the South China Sea in 2009 or something like that. So some of this, I think, has been on the horizon uh, for some time. Um, uh, when, you, uh, when you, although you've very cleverly written this in English, but when this uh, title is translated into German, uh, I think you're quite at home with this title in the United States. Is this, does this come across as too provocative in Germany, or is this frame uh, that Russia and China are revisionist actors 
increasingly accepted also back in your home country? I would say yes, it's increasingly accepted, but the term revisionism as such is a contested term. Uh, interesting and interestingly enough, uh, revisionism and international order are most basic concepts in international affairs, but they are also absolutely under theorized. Um, so you can label something as revisionist and nobody really knows what it means. Mm -hmm. You would have to spell out what the international order is in order to make clear what you mean by revisionism. So I guess academically there is a debate about um, how useful these terms are because they are politically loaded. Yeah. Uh, and you may have a political incentive to call somebody revisionist because it appears like not the right thing to do, obviously. Uh, but I think it's analytically very well taken to speak of them as revisionist powers because that's what they're really aspiring to do. They want to change the liberal international order that has been created and upheld by the US and its partners. And if you think this is a good thing, well, you might applaud them. I think it's a bad thing for us and we should do something about it and prevent them from eroding this established international order even more. I've already cited um, Bridge Colby. I'll, I'll be charitable and cite yet another uh, think tanker from a sister organization, the Center for New American Security. Richard Fontaine has a piece in Foreign Affairs. Um, he runs CNAS in which he uh, uh, basically theorizes about the emerging international order and says he sees conditions of bipolarity as more likely than multipolarity mm -hmm. in the sense that there are two major pools and Third parties will, on key questions like technology, need to coalesce around one of those two uh, poles. Uh, since you've already raised Germany's first ever national security strategy earlier, um, even in his introduction to that document, and it's also in, in the document itself, um, uh, Olaf Scholz, the chancellor, uh, describes a condition of multipolarity as a matter of fact, um, without really explaining why he thinks that necessarily is going to be the condition of the future. In this era of competition with the rise of Russia and China, is, are we looking at a period of Sino-American bipolarity with third parties um, kind of coalescing around each of the poles? Do you think we're more likely to see multipolarity? What does the emerging international system look like? So I would agree here, we see more of a bipolar structure emerging. Some would even say we're already there, because when you look at the balance of power in the world today, there are really just two states that stand out as great powers, even though the United States is still far ahead of China, uh, when you look at comprehensive national power. But I do not see a multipolar system emerging. And it's interesting that you quoted uh, Olaf Scholz, because I would have brought him up otherwise. Uh, you read this again and again, but analytically it doesn't make the thing correct <laughs> if you just repeat it over and over again. But this phrase that we are in a multipolar world or approaching a multipolar world. It has been pervasive in political commentary, but also academic analysis. And from a political standpoint, um, I can just speculate why they would phrase it that way, uh, but it may be considered desirable by some that a, a multipolar distribution of power, which means that there are multiple power centers in the world, who may possibly balance one another out, that this would be desirable for world peace and that we get along better that way. Analytically, I would disagree heavily because multipolar systems are inherently stable. So I don't think it's a wishful proposition, but I also don't think it's a realistic proposition in analytical terms, uh, because who else could be power centers on par with the United States and China at this point? Russia? No, Russia is a, um, a power that is only a great power of note in the nuclear realm, but in all other power metrics, Russia lags behind significantly. Uh, European states, if you take them individually, nobody is really on any sort of eye to eye with the US or China. And if you take, the, uh, if you take them collectively, uh, you would have, you, it would need a level of political unity that is just not there at this point. So I don't see who else would emerge as a, another pole in a multipolar order. I agree with all of that. I, I would say, uh, in addition to it, that I think it was President Obama who somewhat dismissed Russia as a regional declining actor on, on the global stage. And while there might be some truth to that, you know, a dying rabid bulldog can do a lot of damage. 
And uh, even if Russia might not have the aggregate power to create an alternative order, it has enough tools at its disposal and enough power to spoil the Western system in key arenas where we have not really shown sufficient attention. The Sahel might be a great example of that with the ongoing uh, mm. coup in, in Niger and, um, and certainly where the U.S. Has, uh, has either carelessly looked aside, for example, in Syria, where it pursued a uh, separate policy vector towards Iran. Putin was able to move in and with a relatively small application of force, change the entire dynamics in the Middle East and destabilize our closest European allies with a refugee wave that um, proved rather dramatic back in, in, in 2015. So um, I, I would agree. I, I think it's probably a bipolar world, but with actors like Iran, DPRK, and Russia strong enough to badly damage that which the West is trying to achieve. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I fully agree. And this is really part of the argument that I'm making in the book, that polarity does not tell us the full story. Mm -hmm. uh, because countries do not have to balance out others uh, symmetrically in order to create damage to an established status quo order. And you have Russia, for example, as a, I would call it a declining power, because economically, also militarily, Russia is declining. But still, it has enough power resources and windows of opportunity to spoil, to undermine, to attempt to destruct the existing order, which is why I call it destructive revisionism. So the policy course Russia is on right. is really destructive. Russia is incapable of building up an alternative to the US-led order, but it has enough capabilities uh, to engage in information warfare, cyber attacks, um, exploiting all these opportunities that arise in uh, states with fragile statehood, uh, authoritarian governance, you mentioned Syria, etc., to try to undermine the existing status quo. Whereas China, I think you have as a constructive revisionist, right. not a normative no, necessarily that's important. A statement, but a, a, an analytical judgment on them trying to construct an, an alternative. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you thought uh, uh, both Russia and China, because they did not want to be rule takers, but rule makers, uh, I think you even said separately made a judgment at a certain point, perhaps because the distribution of power was shifting and America's lead uh, in the pure power metric had diminished over China in particular, um, uh, even if it was still kind of the world superpower, and to a certain extent over Russia, or perhaps we didn't have attention in, 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 in the near broad of Russia that allowed them to go on the offensive. But all of that sparked a revisionism. Um, at another point in the book, you write that the two of them joined forces, um, I think is, is the quote. So how should we think about the relationship between Russia and China? Are they in alignment? Are they in alliance? Are they separate opportunists? Um, are they able to coordinate their grand strategies? How, how should we think about that? I would start off answering that question with just making the point that if Russia didn't exist, China would still be a revisionist power. And it's true the other way around as well. So even if China did not exist as the country that we have now, Russia would still be a revisionist power. And I think that's important uh, because it reminds us that they have revisionist grievances and opportunities just by themselves. They don't need each other to follow through on their intent to dethrone the United States as the leading power. Uh, but then they also join forces because they have this overarching shared goal. They need to make the world a less US-dominated place and a less liberal place. Because whenever you have rules, and we have all sorts of rules in international institutions, etc., uh, that benefit democracy, rule of law, individual liberty, individual freedom, universal human rights, this just is from both sides, seen as an attack on their regime security, on their uh, notions of how the world ought to be ordered. They want to have, um, see, they want to be seen as normative equals. So autocracy, democracy, they, sh they want this to matter, they, they don't want this to matter at all. Uh, so they join forces in the UN, for example, and call for, a, and I quote here, for a democratization of the international system. Now, this is interesting terminology. Two authoritarian states, uh, they call for more democracy internationally. But what it just means is they want the US to have less of a say, and they want the norms and the principles of this US-led order, democracy, market economics, uh, universal 
human rights, individual freedom, and these cooperative security arrangements, alliances that the United States uphold, also in Russia's and China's neighborhood, they want these things to go away, to matter less. And so they join forces together. Are they an alliance? No, they are not an alliance, but they are in alignment in their overarching goal of where they want the world to go. Um, maybe one additional note on that. Uh, in February 2022, right before the invasion of Ukraine, Russia and China, they issued a joint statement uh, and they pledged a, a no limits friendship or no limits partnership. It obviously has limits. Their partnership, their friendship has limits because China so far has not supported Russia directly uh, in Ukraine. They do not supply uh, weaponry uh, directly, but they support Russia in, in a variety of ways. For example, chips going from China to Russia, sometimes via Turkey, so there are sort of concealed ways of how you transfer these things to Russia. Um, China presents itself as a neutral power, does not, um, has not punished uh, Russia, has not voted with uh, those who called for a punishment of Russia in the Security Council and the UN General Assembly. So China points itself as neutral, but this is really no neutrality. China is firmly on Russia's side, uh, echoing Russian propaganda narratives about the origins of the war. They are in one camp, but their friendship has limits because China wants to avoid costs for itself. So in that sense, it's a very opportunistic approach. Uh, China siding with Russia, but not so openly that it would get exposed to potential sanctions from the West, from the US and European partners. I saw new trade data released today showing the massive spike in Chinese exports to Russia, mm -hmm. which hints at some of the sanctions circumvention that... And natural resources going the other way. Right, that China's engaging with. Um, so uh, my next question, I suppose, is um, why, did you, why did you bound your book at Russia, China, Assault on the Liberal International Order? Surely there are other actors uh, undertaking this as well. Is it, sure, is it purely a, a matter of aggregate power and their ability to actually break through versus, say, a Maduro in Venezuela or a, or a we've already referenced the, the Iranians or um, perhaps the... Uh, the uh, DPRK. And in um, so how, how did you make your choice? So I picked Russia and China because I think they are the most consequential ones for the moment. Uh, of course, you could also add Iran or others to that list. Um, I focused mostly on the European and the Asian theater. Another reason why I picked Russia and China for obvious geographical reasons. But I think those two are really the most consequential ones. China, because it's a rising power, uh, it has amassed leverage in international institutions. It has amassed leverage through its investment initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative. It really is changing the way the world operates, the way the world works. So this is not a future problem, but we are seeing it right now. So China was sort of on the list from the get-go because it's just the most important player in the international system, the only power that comes close to a peer competitor. Um, Russia, as such, is a declining power. And I think this is also why uh, this, I found that study so interesting. So you have a rising power, and traditional knowledge would tell you, okay, rising powers, they turn revisionist because they want the world to change in a way that is more beneficial for themselves. But then you also have a declining power. Uh, and guess what? It doesn't cut back on its ambitions, but to the contrary, a declining power like Russia also uh, goes violent, to preserve what it views as its legitimate prerogatives in its neighborhood and its imperial um, domineering influence in its region around it. So that was another reason. It's just the two most consequential powers due to the geographical theaters that I focused on. And because I find it fascinating to see that rising and declining powers alike can become a true challenge for the established international order, which goes against the grain of what many people might think. Uh, and you already mentioned quotes. Um, we had it in the political system here and on the other side of the Atlantic as well that Russia was not to be reckoned with anymore. It's you know, fading out as a great power. Well, declining great powers, they can go down pretty violently. And I think that's what we see with regards to Russia because it doesn't have 
many other tools of influence at its disposal. It cannot market its own political system, its own economic system uh, as sort of, it cannot generate influence by that. China can. It's the promise that if you want to get rich without democrat democratizing and going down that difficult road, uh, you know, we are your partner of choice and we can help you get rich. Russia doesn't have that leverage in a constructive sense. And again, it's, I really mean that in an analytical way, yeah. not a normative way. Uh, so Russia is a declining power, uh, uses violent means, the destructive elements, because this is really what's left. It reminds me a little bit of the old saying that uh, some Western Europeans would rather be wealthy, but a second rate power, Russia would rather be poor and a great power. And so uh, if that prestige, that narrative is so important to you, even as you're speaking to slide, you might invest everything you can into a, I don't want to call it a last gasp because it's silly to just dismiss Russia as a, you know, a thing of the past. Russian mm -hmm. history is full of, of, of ebb and flow. But to make a major play for Ukraine and, and, um, and, and you know, break out through the Black Sea. But that's an important point because it reminds us that ideology really matters. Yeah. And we've come to believe, especially in the West, that everything was just due to economic rationality. Yeah. And if we think back, folks would always say, oh, Russia is not going to invade Ukraine because it will cost so much. Um, it, will be, it, was, it will destroy their economy. If you're an ideologically driven actor, and if you believe that this greater Russian empire is what really matters, then you're willing to take costs. So we shouldn't, our own economic rationale, and our economic rationality bias may cloud our thinking sometimes when we assess what is possible, what is thinkable for other actors. Yeah, I also think ideology matters in the sense that, um, you know, when Putin complains of the revolutions in Georgia, in Ukraine, in Kazakhstan, as, um, as a, a Western-inspired CIA plot to to overthrow his near abroad and ultimately to target Russia itself. He's obviously, I think, deep in the throes of conspiracy and vastly overblowing matters. I will say, though, that when he looks around, he does not see in Xi Jinping a threat to his style of government, but he does see in the West um, and in democracy and liberal values a potential challenge to his authoritarian style of rule. And so in that sense, um, you know, he always, I think, viewed the West as, or perhaps more recently, there's a debate on whether or not Putin has changed, but he viewed the West as, um, as a little bit more of an existential threat in that sense, and going to Xi uh, and to work with the Chinese does not pose those same challenges to him. Absolutely. Another point I make in this book is that we have to think holistically about what security really is. So what is it that states are after in an anarchic system? Traditionally, we think in very narrow terms about physical security. So security to your own physical existence as a state. And by that metric, you know, nobody's threatening Russia whatsoever. So the West, NATO, nobody is thinking about invading Russia. But still the Putin regime feels very insecure and threatened by the West because of regime security concerns. So if democracy takes root all around Russia, what if that happens in Russia itself? And it's one of those most basic fears that the Putin regime has, that it will be swept away from power by society, for example. Um, states also have what I call ontological security concerns. So if your mindset is that you are destined to lead as an imperial great power, if you're destined to control your own neighborhood that goes far beyond your sovereign territorial borders, then every influence of a third power working with those sovereign nations will be considered you know, a security threat. Obviously, it has no rationale to it in legal terms. Uh, sovereign states can make their own sovereign choices. Uh, but we have this disconnect that the Russians would always blame the West for intrusive policies, for meddling in their own sphere of influence. Whereas from the Western point of view, it was just talking to sovereign nations who decide that their future is in the West, that they are better served by the Western model of governance and order than by the Russian one. And they have good reason to believe so. Because if you want to prosper, if you want to have a, a just model of governance, I wouldn't look to Russia because it offers none of it. I would look to the EU and NATO and the United States because it does offer 
uh, a better future for those countries in the Russian neighborhood. Um, you finally worked in, as I read in this book, or as I developed in this book, any good book talk requires a little bit of self-advertisement, so I'm glad you finally got around to that. We'll stay on that theme as a closing topic, which is you don't just describe uh, the challenge that we face, but you try to lay out prescriptively what you call neocontainment. What is a strategy of neocontainment, and why should uh, the West follow it? So if you think about where we are right now and where we want to go in the future, um, that's how I started out thinking about policy prescriptions. When you think about the strategy of engagement that the West has practiced towards Russia in the post-Cold War period, towards China, essentially since uh, the beginning of the opening policy in the late 1970s, it was a policy of reaching out, um, trade, uh, intensifying trade connections, dialogue, and people hope that this would sort of change both of these countries and bring them into alignment with Western ideals and make them responsible stakeholders of the established status quo order. And as I mentioned before, I thought that was flawed to begin with, and it is absolutely flawed going forward because it would mean a sellout of own interests if you just keep working with potential adversaries with no strings attached, hoping for the best. But guess what? They do not want to become westernized. But they want to change that order. Now, the alternative would be a policy of um, accommodation or appeasement. Appeasement is a loaded term, so I'd um, rather go with a policy of accommodation. So maybe you say, OK, these powers, maybe they do have legitimate grievances. Let them have their way in certain respects. Maybe we can get along well if you just give them what they want. But frankly, that's, um, a, a no, that's no path forward, because it would mean a world that looks radically different from the world that we live in right now. It would be a world where you would separate the globe in spheres of influence, where essentially Eastern Europe would be sort of delegated to Russia, no questions asked. This is not a desirable world that we want to live in. It would be a world where China ingrains its principles, uh, whatever benefits the Communist Party dictatorship at home in, onto the international stage. This is not the way to go. So neocontainment is essentially uh, the conclusion that I drew from excluding possible alternatives that might be on the table. And it means setting boundaries to what these countries can do to the West and the world at large. Prior policies, they either rested upon the flawed notion that you can change Russia and China within. I don't think you can. So you would just accept that they are the way they are. They are dictatorships. They have different ideas about how the world ought to be ruled, about the principles that should guide international relations. We cannot change that, but we can try to put limits to how influential they can be on the international stage. So neocontainment essentially means uh, not dividing up the world in spheres of influences. Containment might have that ring, but setting boundaries to what Russia and China can do for themselves, but also to others. I think one of the struggles of that, um, that policy in the past, at least, has been that while on the one hand there are those who are truly Pollyannish about, um, about bringing China and Russia into uh, into an international order where trade is blossoming and everything is honey and light. There are those who I think have had a have had a have had a more more steely eyed view of reality. But um, when they do set those boundaries and they are violated, um, at some point the enforcement mechanisms just break down in a new negotiation, try to win them over a setting of new standards or new boundaries, which invariably are moved one step back and. Uh, and then in our regular rhythm of elections, if I think back to 2008, uh, President Putin invades Georgia in the summer during the Beijing Olympics. President Obama comes in thereafter and basically uh, uh, basically acts as if nothing had happened because it's a new democratic cycle. It's a new relationship that he's beginning to forge as if Russia just began on January 20th, 2009 when he came into power. So one of the, one of the challenges or one of the really difficult parts of execution, I think, is actually setting boundaries and then enforcing them uh, when they're violated. And that's where I think at times we've come up a little short in our desperate desire to avoid confrontation and a downward spiral. 
which isn't to say I disagree with yeah. the strategy, but I think it's just one of the difficulties in, in application. You're absolutely right. So domestic politics, of course, can be a challenge. Um, I see a firm China consensus emerging here in the United States. And also Europe has aligned more closely with the United States in recent years. So views on China have soured quite a bit. Uh, and it was due to China's actions. Uh, it was not the US meddling with European powers as Beijing would sometimes portray it. No, it, China does things that European countries just do not like and they stand up against it. So I agree with you, the domestic politics side of it can be a challenge. Also the alliance side of it can be a challenge because states do not want to sign up for a new Cold War. They want to do not want to pick sides. But the forces of just the, the structural constraints that we see in the international system, I guess, will force some states to make decisions. And we're sort of back at the beginning where we started with talking about Germany and European security. European states have to think hard and think to, have to think twice about how they deal with China going forward. Because they cannot, <laughs> and companies as well. But we should not assume that the United States takes up the, the defense bill for Europeans and stands on our, at our side when it comes to Ukraine and deterring Russia. And then we just do our own thing when it comes to China. So more alignment needs to be created there. But we've had a positive track record in recent years. Um, when you think back 10 years ago, China was really an issue that divided Europe and the United States. We have come much closer. Great, and to uh, understand it better, this book's really um, a, a delight to read. Um, it's not for the faint of heart, it's chock full of detail, um, but a great, a great read, Russia, China, and the Revisionist Assault on the Western Liberal International Order. Thank you so much for joining us for another Hudson uh, Institute event. You can check out all of our work at hudson.org. Galinda Koichler, thank you so much for coming and doing this book talk, and uh, best of luck uh, with the book going forward. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks.